Hello, and thank you for joining the POCUS Certification Academy for today's POCUS Bytes webinar. I'm Tori, and I'll be your facilitator. We are now starting, so all lines have been muted. Please use the Q&A box for any questions or the chat box for comments you have throughout the webinar. Today's presentation will include a PowerPoint presentation, and then we'll have a few minutes for questions and answers at the end. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment and invite you to visit our webpage at www.pocus.org, where you can find all previously recorded webinars searchable by topic. Also, I invite you to, a, to attend our March webinar on ultrasound use for vascular access and basic cardiac and pulmonary assessment for nurses, occurring on March 17th at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Our presenter today is Dr. Bernard Bulwer, Considered an out of, outside the box, visionary and strategic thinker, and a physician ahead of his time by leading experts at Harvard, Columbia, the Cleveland Clinic, and beyond. Dr. Bulwer's focus is to educate and equip today's students and practitioners with the foundation tools for responsible use of cardiac ultrasound echo stethoscope. Such tools are designed to complement medical education, diagnostic medical sonograms, clinical practice, and global health. Dr. Bowler, a native of Belize, is recognized by the U.S. government as a person of extraordinary ability based on his contribution in the field of echocardiography education. He has served as author, co-author, editor, and medical illustrator of a number of textbooks and didactic works in echocardiography. It's our pleasure to have you with us today. Take it away, Dr. Bowler. Thank you, Tori. Uh, our topic today is designing focus cardiovascular curricula. Should we disrupt or should we complement? This is actually a follow-up from a previous webinar that I gave about when POCUS becomes culture. And the whole point of that was that point-of-care ultrasound is best integrated when we meet the culture of medicine as practice. So today's topic, next slide, uh, conflicts of interest, none. And the outline of our presentation, could you go through ne the next slide? Yeah. The outline is we're looking at what is taught in medical schools generally and looking at what is actually taught in the most popular uh, cardiovascular medical texts used across the United States and Canada and beyond. And looking also at focus, which is focused cardiac ultrasound as an extension of the physical examination. Uh, we'll take a look, number four, at aspects of instrumentation, looking at some innovations. And number five and six, we we'll look at how we can supplement the current cardiovascular curricula using point of care ultrasound. And then we'll touch a little bit on what the pandemic has done and how POCUS can impact that. And if we go to the next slide, generally throughout medical education, whether you're looking at the preclinical years or the clinical years, you'll see these subjects regarding like the, the human body, right? Integrating human physiology. Then you have your preclinical years. And then you also have, next slide, you also have aspects of the health science and technology where you can see more functional anatomy, cardiovascular pathophysiology, and aspects of clinical medicine. Next slide. And you also have, in depending on the institution, you know, courses where you can focus more on things like anatomy and you know, surgery and other aspects of cardiovascular uh, medical education. Next slide. Here is our challenge in all of these curricula regarding point of care ultrasound. What is the perspective that really matters when it comes to introducing point of care ultrasound or focus cardiac ultrasound in medical education? Should we be reinventing the wheel? Is POCUS as a separate discipline, is this the end that we wanna introduce POCUS into medical education? or is it a means to an end? The way I think of this is I think of POCUS as a tool. 
In the same way that we look at the dissecting scalpel that historically was used during anatomical dissection, I look at it in the same way in terms of what we're trying to achieve using the stethoscope, which meant to put something on the chest, steto, and then you can scope, hopefully see. I look at point of care ultrasound in the same way I see other medical imaging techniques like chest of tray, cardiac CT, or cardiac MRI. Because at the end of the day, the object of, of our section is not the technology, it's the kind of clinical information, the diagnostic information that the technology itself can provide. Next slide. So we're looking at the heart of the matter. Technology, not as the end, but as the means to an end. And our focus is about, in this case, we're looking at cardiac structure, cardiac function. We're looking at cardiac anatomy or pathology or physiology or pathophysiology. And in terms of where point of care ultrasound or focus cardiac ultrasound applies is to me the task is how we can make this culture or seamlessly integrated you know in what doctors medical students normally do compared to it being as a separate discipline next slide so if we're to look at technology generally right next slide what's up if we're to look at technology generally that we're looking at how we can take a technology from being something that is the, for example, a new stethoscope that everybody is going to be used. And you, yes, you do have the early adopters. You have the emergency medicine physicians. You have the critical care specialists who need answers now, who actually don't need to be coaxed into using point of care ultrasound. They want it. They need it. But the bulk of physicians, if you travel around any hospital around this country, you'll still see doctors carrying around a stethoscope rather than, for example, a handheld or a pocket ultrasound device. Those are the bulk of the physicians, the internists on the medical block, on the surgical block or other specialties, right? And there is a gap, there is a chasm. There is a reason why You'd have, for example, emergency medicine physicians on one hand, critical care specialists who need answers now, who don't need to wait, who need to expedite you know, patient care. There is a big difference between that block and a block who carry out medicine and medical education in the way they do. And next slide. The challenge, therefore, in all of this is how do we cross that gap, that chasm? regarding point of care ultrasound. How do we take these doctors who are, whether in medical school, in training, or walking around the hospital with their stethoscopes, how do we reach out to them to have, rather than their stethoscope in their pocket, to have these point of care instruments as a part of what they normally do, right? And the way to do that, next slide, is to build a, next slide, bridge. Right? How do we bridge that gap? And what is that bridge? That bridge, next slide, is, I recall because I've been, this subject had been vexing to me from, you know, I train in the Longwood Medical Area. I, you know, I was always trying to encourage the ECHO, the cardiovascular group, to implement ultrasound as a normal part of the curriculum, right? And the first manual that I brought out if you look at the top left on the side, they, in very small print, you may not be able to make, uh, make it out, but it, it says echocardiography pocket guide. But in big words, you would see the trans thoracic examination because my emphasis was not on the tool. My emphasis was on examining the chest, specifically examining the heart. And for me, this was where I was taking the focus from off the tool to the information that the tool could provide. And that's how I would say, that's how you adopt or integrate technology seamlessly. When it is no longer the focus, when it's like, you know, people don't speak anymore about, oh, um, I'm gonna get a desktop or a laptop. You say, I'm gonna, you know, log in on the internet. 
in the same way when you're going to examine the heart you're not gonna oh am i gonna be focused on the focus well when you lose that focus and you just go and get the job done meaning that you use a tool next slide please for example when you look at the stethoscope we don't speak about a stethoscope exam we said examine the chest or examine the heart or do some auscultate tell me what your findings and that's what i mean by focus becoming culture next slide and so what we're looking at for this is not anything new because if you look at the most widely used textbook you know in cardiovascular medical education in medical schools all around this country it's this book right and if you flick through next slide if you flick through this the table of contents from chapter number one what is cardiac structure and function the cardiac cycle cardiac imaging hemodynamics the ekg Atherosclerosis that has to do with blood flow, ischemic heart disease, you know, an acute presentation, valvular heart disease, heart failure, cardiomyopathies, mechanisms of arrhythmias, hypertension. And if you go to the next slide, you will see that in every one of these topics covered in an established medical book, every single chapter there, point of care ultrasound or focused cardiac ultrasound speaks to every chapter in that book. This is what doctors are taught. And so to me, it is logical that you meet people just like when you do dissection, you're trying to find out what the structure of the heart is. And when you start doing the cardiac cycle, you're trying to deal with you know, the cardiac function and vigorous cycle, next slide. And so when we look at, at this whole dilemma about how POCUS fits in to medical education i really like this uh slide that i saw on twitter it was just uh, maybe a couple of months ago and there was a button there where there was this debate is POCUS an extension of the physical exam or is it a diagnostic testing and i like what they said we could read it it can be either or both the power of POCUS lies in the myriad of ways it can be intelligently employed and what matters most is what matters most is that it is done so first and foremost for the benefit of those patients we serve. So we're, we're not getting caught up in the technology. We're looking at how we can get the answers we need to look after the people who we're responsible for, right? And so if you go to the next slide, I would add to that, next slide. I would add to that because point of care ultrasound or ultrasound, the technology is very versatile as you'll see uh, coming up. But I would add to that option, a third option. It's actually a medical education tool in its own right, in the same way that you would have about a scalpel or that you would have a, stink, a speed gun. And you'll understand what I mean by speed gun because this is one of the fascinating things about ultrasound. Next slide. One of the fascinating things, if you look at what ultrasound actually is, when you hold up that transducer, when you hold up, this transducer here, it actually, when it's activated, if it's a two-dimensional transducer, you're actually looking at a sonographic scalpel. That's why it's, it's called cross-sectional ultrasound. You know, you had one-dimensional ultrasound over time, which was M mode, and then you have, you know, what you call two-dimensional, which is cross-sectional. You're actually slicing through anatomy. And then the other fascinating thing about ultrasound is that if you start tuning in, not on the strength of the reflection, but if you start looking at the change of frequency, you can get some information which blows your mind. What, what I mean by that is that you can point and shoot, just like you look at, use a traffic gun or infrared to detect the speed and the direction and the characteristic of flow. You can literally non-invasively, just think about these kids who would have had, who would have needed cardiac catheterization. You could literally point and detect blood flow, the velocity of flow, the direction of flow, the characteristic of flow, whether it is smooth, laminar, or disturbed, turbulent due to you know, valvular or, or shunts. So ultrasound is so versatile that it could literally speak to everything that we learn in medical education, cardiovascular specifically. Next slide. And throughout the expert bodies, to some degree or another, they said, you know what, 
in terms of physical examination, this tool gives us more information. You can extend the physical examination. And if you go through the next series of slides quickly, if you go through these slides here, you would see, you know, um, again, I spoke about, you know, you doing, putting something on the chest, ultrasound can do that. It can extend the examination. So when you auscultate, you do that. If you look at the American Society of Echocardiography, they established that this is a role. We can extend the physical examination and get, for example, if you hear a murmur, okay, the big challenge is which valve is leaking. Well, it takes the guess game out of that. You put it on the chest and you could see which valve is leaking. As a matter of fact, they showed that, you know, studies show that a first year medical student with 18 hours of training can tell you yes or no answers, like which valve is leaking and is the heart squeezing better than a trained cardiologist who is experienced with a stethoscope. Next slide. And so throughout this field, the ASC, for example, 2019, in 2013, they said, you know what? We can't really use this for medical students, but fast forward 2019, hey, you know what? We can teach cardiac anatomy and pathology and all of that thing using ultrasound. Next slide. And you also have, you know, the Society of Ultrasound and Medical Education. These were some of the pioneers. They started looking at how to build curricula and lessons learned. Next slide. And we also have, um, you know, the, the American Heart Association, the Journal of the American College of Cardiology published recently, you know, how we can implement this slide. Next slide, please. What we're actually uh, looking at here is that even, this is dated, but even the HMS Academy, you know, they were looking at ways that you can help to stimulate and support the creation and implementation of innovative approaches to learning and assessment. And this is where point of care ultrasound as a medical education tool on its own can really do lots more than it is used for at the current moment. Next slide. And so technology wise, you know, go back 200 years ago, there was some innovation built on children who Lanek in, the, in, 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 in Paris saw kids listening through bamboo or some pipes or whatever. And he said, he was a carpenter turned physician. He said, you know what? I could duplicate that and try it on the chest. Long story short, you had the advent of the stethoscope, next slide. And then you had different iterations of the stethoscope come about, you know, where you have, you know, Littmann and Virus Sprague and so forth. And then you start having people digitizing the stethoscope. And then you had device that came about 20, 2005, 2006, 2007, like the V-Scan, which said, hey, this is a new stethoscope. We can now finally see. Next slide. And so we have seen that the dream of the stethoscope, which was the scope, to see was fulfilled in the advent of the point of care ultrasound devices, especially when they started fitting in your pocket. So we're almost there. Next slide. So we see all kinds of cool instruments, real game changers fit in your pocket that you could do and see anywhere, any place, anytime. But here's the dilemma. The big thing has been, hey, get rid of the old stethoscope. Here's the new stethoscope. But here's the problem. They've been saying that for 20 years and it has, ha has not happened. Well, ask yourself the question why. Because the stethoscope, it is not just a stethoscope, not just a status symbol. Yes, it is. But it actually speaks to the history of medical education where we're trying to get information. We get information through history. We get information through examining the patient. We get information through using all our senses. We see as well as we hear. And it does not mean that you have to get rid of hearing just so that you can see. Who said you had to get rid of the stethoscope just so you can see? Tell that to any person. Go deaf so you can, you know, not be blind, okay? Well, that's a false choice. Next slide. Because the company, there's a company that teamed up with educators and really came up with a brilliant solution. 
And I'm asking myself this question, why? I mean, this debate is over as far as I'm concerned, right? Why can't you have your cake and eat it? Why can't you listen as well as see? Next slide. Let that play. I don't know if you can hear that. I wish you can. But in all my life, I have never seen in real time using ultrasound or x-ray or sorry ct or mri i've never seen a moving heart and then hearing the heart sounds that i can see and so this device manufacturer literally synced a stethoscope along with what we're seeing here a stethoscope with ultrasound so you can actually see. It means that you know what's causing the first heart sound. You can time, you can do so many things with this. Plus, it's coupled with the electrocardiogram. And there's another thing that you may see here that I'll touch on. But you can see some labels popping in and out. That's actually artificial intelligence pattern recognition happening in real time so that you can also guide and label the heart valves. Next slide. Um, this is a bit long, but we're not going to go through this uh, that long. But if you can fast forward it on the bottom there, I know it's a big, it's almost a minute, we don't go through that. But what you're actually seeing here is artificial intelligence at work, where when you're trying to do the exam, it is telling you when you have nailed it. And you can, it's just like if you're using your fingerprint recognition in your phone, right? It knows what your fingerprint is and it knows it when it sees it. So even if you have your hands, your finger vertical, or if you have it on the side or off angle, it can identify. And so these tools can be integrated to get take it to another level. Next slide. And so, for example, you can have these extended into visuals where you can actually guide the user, right? And all of this is part of what ultrasound and point of care ultrasound can deliver we can actually start guiding people how to see structures as well as how to perform exams. Next slide. And, and based on this same paradigm, it is essentially a simulation tool. It's a medical education tool. It's a simulator to teach cardiac structure and function and to take it another level. Next slide. Is that just think about what we're facing right now. We're facing a pandemic, social distancing. But even before that, one of the things that has always plagued uh, medical education is that the this, this sick patients tend to have some of the most interesting murmurs. So just imagine someone there with a very leaky valve and a loud murmur who is short of breath, or someone with severe rheumatic heart disease with narrowed mitral valves, narrowed eartric valves, and everybody wants to hear it, but the patient is very sick. And you know what happens? You know, the head says only one or two person can examine, but the truth is after hours, people go there and hassle the patient. Every patient will tell you the medical students beg and the patient can't say no, but if you really speak to the patient, they don't really like that. And it's actually not cool because you're sick. You can't even sleep. Everybody wants to listen to your heart. And so even ultrasound, if you can integrate ultrasound with heart sounds where everybody can Bluetooth and listen simultaneously, and everyone can actually see, including the patient, you really advance some very important bread and butter issues in medical education and training. Next slide. And here it comes to how we can actually integrate this technology. You know, the Wiggers diagram, I'll tell you up front, most people are turned off by cardiology because they say it's too difficult and there's a whole bunch of lines and scribbles. What's going on? Well, you know what, that is because people were looking at it in terms of timing and it's very abstract. But the coolest thing about POCUS that impresses me, which is what I said about creating a lot of tools, is that you can superimpose echocardiogram and echodoppler findings all on the Wiggers diagram and you could make it real in the same way that you're actually seeing images. And these were just some attempts to impose what's happening with the heart on the cardiac cycle. And if you look at the next slide, you will see that you can actually um, get that information, that structural information, as well as what I told you about that 
uh, Doppler or blood flow information. Next slide. And you, so you can actually be looking at all these intricacies. For example, if you look at the left-hand side, the same instrument, you can actually be timing what, if you look at the top middle, right, that's what actually you're seeing. But what's going on there? That is the cardiac cycle. It's not an abstract thing. It's actually stuff that's going on in the heart. And to me, it is almost like a video game, right, where you can actually see the different moving parts and what's going on. And you can build the cardiac cycle. And to me, that really breeds understanding of the fundamental physiology, as well as the pathophysiology, or so many aspects of heart songs and what you could examine, you know, using point of care ultrasound or focus. And that's why I set out putting these tools together. And if you look at the next slide, right, you know, that was one of the foundation tools in a series that I put together. Next slide quickly. These are just a glimpse of some of the other tools in that next slide. You could flick that. Those are stuff that I did. And then you have also simulators, which are standalone. These are not ultrasound, but they're trying to simulate ultrasound to get the same information. So you have simulators there, which people can do using a computer. But the way I look at it is focus itself is a simulator. And if you could integrate the anatomical structure as well as the physiology and build on that with pathology and pathophysiology, you literally have, you cut out, for want of a better word, the middleman meaning that you go, you cut the chase, ultrasound is safe, you know, students can learn and you can literally in a classroom, literally build the cardiac cycle and learn and interact and teach cardiac anatomy, physiology, pathophysiology, all in the classroom or at the bedside using ultrasound. Next slide. And then you have also other cool tools that is happening. We have all heard about, you know, Oculus or HoloLens and others on the market where you literally create a hologram, right? or recreate you know, a virtual reality environment, or you could mix that with the real environment called mixed reality or augmented reality paradigms. Next slide. Right. So from a global health point of view, right? from a focused cardiac ultrasound, this was just showing, this is a program we developed for Ghana. We had a study in Rwanda, and it was to deal with big public health problems like rheumatic heart disease, a curable heart disease that you can literally adopt focus as well as what we call task shifting. By task shifting, I mean that in areas where you don't have the medical expertise, if you have the device, you can have the remote connectivity and the remote guidance, and you could get information, right? Screen patients, right? Treat them early in terms of secondary prevention, make sure the kids have their you know, uh, penicillin monthly injections, right? And you can literally prevent recurrence or repeated damage to the heart valves and literally prevent or cure the kind of complications resulting from acute rheumatic fever. So POCUS in a nutshell really addresses a lot of the fundamentals that we try to do every day, whether in medical teaching or in clinical training or, or, or clinical care. Next slide. And here comes the, the pandemic. Again, one of the coolest things that POCUS has done, it literally meets you where you're at. So, the only, I mean, yes, you have teleradiology, but if you think about global health, if you think about home care, right, the only technology, the only medical imaging technology or cardiovascular imaging technology that can go anywhere, any place, anytime, is focus, is focus, right? And so next slide, this is the last slide here, is that the whole challenge in terms of the severely restricted access to clinical sites, the limited access to hands-on clinical training, point of care ultrasound shows up again, very versatile, that there are so many aspects of it that you could plug in into telehealth or teletraining, you know, even for students in programs where they don't have access to hospitals as before, they can have their own focus bubbles. And as I touched on earlier, you could have virtual and simulated learning environments. And so in a nutshell, I, I see cardiovascular point of care ultrasound as something that perfectly complements medical education and training. And uh, so I think we've covered pretty much, next slide, what we set out to do.
you know, like what is taught in medical schools, what is established, and how we can extend, you know, the physical examination and get the answers in focus. We looked a little bit about the instrumentation and innovation, and there are many resources that you could use to supplement, you know, the cardiovascular curriculum without having a separate discipline as focus. And then, you know, it, it, it answers the question and the challenges of our times, even in this pandemic where social distancing and other restrictions apply. And so I thank you for this opportunity and I'm open to any questions that you may have. Thank you. Great, great presentation, Dr. Bowa. Thank you uh, for all of that great information. Uh, I will say before we jump into question and answers, there have been a couple attendees, you raised your hand during the presentation. If you could just type in your question into the uh, Q&A box. Uh, there should be a box there that says Q&A on your screen. Open that up, type in your question, uh, and we'll make sure we get to that. Um, so let's go ahead and jump in. We did uh, receive uh, a comment and a question. Uh, so I'll just read that uh, for you, Dr. Bulwer, and then you can address the question. Great. A uh, comment was, I absolutely agree that POCUS needs to be in medical school education. Question is, how do you propose training the faculty to teach the students? Well, you, you hit the nail on the head. Um, it has to be buy-in at every level. Buy-in from, you have to train the trainers. You have to have them on board. I think one of the, here's what is the biggest problem of our time. One of the biggest problems of our time. Everyone is maxed out. Their time is maxed out. There's only 24 hours in one day. And even without focus, you have enough problems and nobody wants to be bothered, right? But, you know, the, the beautiful thing about ultrasound is it's literally, I see as an education tool, it's literally like a video game, right? It's a real cool tool that it, it demystifies a lot of the stuff that students find difficult and teaches themselves. Because even for myself, I've been immersed in a cardiac ultrasound for you know, over 16 years. But I can tell you, it's always fresh. It's always new. You never get bored because each heart is doing so many fascinating things. So it really helps you as a teacher to learn. So what I would propose is that because these devices have gotten so cheap, is that there needs to be maneuvers, just like how you get a phone. And the beautiful thing is that these can be plugged into your phone or your tablet, which has all your education you know, materials. And it's a great way for you to relearn your cardiac anatomy or your cardiac cycle or your heart murmurs. So yes, training the trainers is important, but the strategy is to let them know that this is not you learning POCUS. It is, this is POCUS helping you to, to, to elucidate or to enlighten or to make real a lot of the stuff that you've been learning in abstract. And that's what personally, I love about POCUS. It really makes you understand what you normally do better, right? So it's not a strange tool. And to me, the least, the less you disrupt people's schedules or the less you disrupt their time or you give them value where it's worth investing both their time and money as well as the, the holy grail. That is, it makes you a better physician. It makes you get better answers more quickly. You know, it, it makes you understand a lot of the reasons why, for example, you know, you have a patient with shorter breath and the heart looks like it's squeezing. But if you really understand that, you know what, it's not just the pump, it's also how stiff the pump is that could give you shorter breath. So there are a lot of things, there are a lot of benefits. And so I believe the reason why people buy a phone and learn about a phone is because it benefits them to do many things, organize themselves, make phone calls, get access to their education. And so training the trainers is important, but the strategy of training the trainers and to have them buy in, why should I have this device? Why should I invest my time or my resources or should I ask my school or my hospital to get this? It's because it helps everyone. It helps the teachers, it helps the students, and most importantly, it helps those who depend on, on, on our care. Great. Uh, okay, great. We are getting some more questions coming in from the attendees. So uh, the next question came in, where will we get focus cardiac training online for exam? Um, there are a number of programs out there. One of the things, um, you know, as I said, we are living in the information age. 
um, what I personally had set out to do is because, you know, when I set out to even create tools, I wanted that. I mean, I trained a banker for God's sake, a banker of 25 years old, <laughs> 20, a banker of 25 years, right? Banking, right? To pass their board exams using cardiac ultrasound. And I said that because training doesn't have to be difficult or confined to a classroom. I believe is that if you have these devices and ultrasound is a safe technology, it is really a technology that could be plugged into your phone and plugged into you know, your tablet. And I believe that incrementally, you can literally have a book manual and teach yourself ultrasound if you're interested. And so that's how I set out to create my manuals that you can visually know how to move the screen and appreciate what you see. And I think this tool is so engaging and that's a very basic, simple way of learning that if you have a tool, if you want to learn to ride a bike, you don't go and rent a bike, you have your own bike. And because the price of these things have gone down and you could get some of these things, I think maybe for like $50 a month now, right? Cheaper than a phone subscription, right? That is one way. Of course, there are, there are ways to go and attend classes and so forth. But I'm a firm believer that what the, what the point of care paradigm has done, it has brought down the cost so that people can have their own device. And I bet you this one thing, if you have your own ultrasound device, you never want to give up on it. I mean, just think about it. There are lots of answers beyond the heart. You know, you can know what's going on with, for example, your bladder. Is your bladder emptying? You know, um, if you want to know something on your liver, or is the heart beating or squeezing or something that you carry could carry around with you and you do just like selfies, you know? I mean, that's not an irresponsible statement. It's just that from a training point of view, the device, access to the device, the cost of the device, right? And the many core different courses that are out there, those are, to me, that's a very low hanging fruit to have, to start on the road to having not just saying that you did a course, but to have it just like your own stethoscope, you know, a device, a tool, which is a part of what you do every day. That's my, those are my thoughts. Great. Okay, great. We've got uh, a few more minutes here. So we've got some more questions. Next question that came in, Dr. Bowler is how focused is cardiac focus? How focused is cardiac focus? You know, you had asked me for some questions at the, you know, prior to this um, meeting, I don't know in what context you were going to share that. But there is a debate because back in 2013, I had reached out to the AIUM group and the Society of Ultrasound and Medical Education because truth be told, there's a lot of politics in medicine. And there's always this challenge about who should do what or what should be involved here. Um, Whose responsibility is this? Here's the short answer. The short answer is this. What is your scope of training? Are you a student? Are you in emergency medicine? Are you on the wards? Are you in global health in a clinical setting? Whatever is expected of you in your current scope of training, that is what you should focus on. So my answer is focus on what you're focused on and put let cardiac ultrasound or any type of ultrasound applied to that area. You can't go wrong if you do that. Uh, one of the challenges is that you have a lot of devices. Some have more specifications, for example, Doppler. Now, if you're to look at the assessment of heart failure or vascular heart disease, that's the purview of cardiology, meaning that you can always put a Doppler transducer and get a tracing, but have you done it right? Have you done a comprehensive exam? The answer is no. So you should focus on, you know what? I see a murmur, it looks, and then you refer. But if you're at the point of care in the emergency room, someone comes in, blunt trauma, collapse, and you see anything that looks like, you know, hemopericardium, right? Tamponade, that's within your scope of training. It's an emergent setting, but you can do what you do within your scope of training. So the short answer is focus on what you're focused on and don't go beyond that. Otherwise you start getting into uh, on shaky, shaky ground. Hope that answers. So focus yeah, on what the focus done. Okay. Your scope uh, is tricky. Yeah. 
Okay, great. Uh, Dr. Bowen, next question was, uh, which handheld device do you recommend? It all depends on what you, what you want, what you need, what you have. They always say the best camera. What is it? The one that you have. If you don't have any and you're looking for one, you know, price is going to be an important issue, right? But then you have to look at not just the initial acquisition price. If, if a device is said, hey, it's $2,000, that's the entry level. But then you have to pay four or $500 a year for warranty. Then you have another device here that maybe say $5,000 and it gives you a five-year warranty and you don't have to have any subscriptions. It's your choice. It depends on what your pocket could afford. There are good devices out there. And um, I, I think um, more important than the device is what you're trying to use it for. Now, if you notice that I did focus on a device that had a stethoscope integrated, um, if you're an educator and you're looking for a tool that can help you learn ultrasound, but also one that could help engage and help teaching the cardiac cycle and help also some of those solutions that I mentioned, like many people can listen and see at the same time, there's only one device that I know that does that on the planet, and that's the one that I showed. That's a uh, device. It's, it's made by the company Econos. There, I think the former founders of Sonosite. Uh, Cosmos is that device name, right? Cosmos Torso, right? But that's one. It's um, it's cost-effective device, but it can do what the others can't do. Meaning that you can hear and see, mm -hmm. as well as it has a full uh, cardiac instrument. But if you don't need those functions, then you can choose pretty much based on your 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 pocket. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, great. Couple more here. I know we're uh, getting close to our time, so thank you everyone for uh, sticking with us through uh, the questions and answers. Great questions coming in, by the way. Thank you, everyone. Uh, next. Uh, question was, my question is, what are the strategy to make the POCUS accessible and affordable to third world countries and training modalities? Well, you're great. That's actually one of my major focus. Um, at the intro, you mentioned I was born in a little country that the population could fit in one big football stadium with less than 100,000 people. Um, and so I am by background. I'm very cognizant of life outside of these United States. You know, I train here. As a matter of fact, that informed even the chapters that I wrote. I wanted people to know how to do these exams. And we're actually pursuing solutions, you know, for countries in Africa, in Latin America, in parts of Asia, and um, to try to get build comprehensive curriculum. Some of them I touched on um, in the weeks to come, I'll be meeting with educators in universities and to find ways to get the technology into the hands of students. And part of that will be philanthropy because the need is there and a lot of cool things are happening, you know. You know, we have the tablet platform for the content of education and we have devices that can be plugged into those platforms. And the whole aim is that we can get them, you know, as part of the school curriculum. And the same way people have phones, the same way we expect that people can access the ultrasound device. You can have some bare bones, golf cart type device that can get you some of the basic information. And we're focused on that. And so stay tuned because this is something that I'm, I'm committed to. This is part of my uh, life task in the future to democratize, not just the technology and the education, but to democratize the access to these technologies. Okay, fantastic. We want, we want every student, but we also want every clinic, every village, every mm -hmm. community across the world, whether you're in North Korea or whether you're in Timbuktu or in Belize or what have you, right? Yeah. I mean that. That's part of our task. Yeah, agreed. Okay, next question that came in. Uh, we've just got a, a few more, so we're going to try to get through those uh, real quick. I know we are at the time. We try to keep them to 45 minutes, but we've got uh, three more to go, so I would like to try to tackle those real quick. Uh, next one is the student must understand physics concepts such as attenuation, reflection, angle of incidence through transmission, Doppler angle, aliasing, et cetera. How do you recommend we accomplish this? Nope, nope, nope. I am a firm believer that that is the purview of 
phonographers. Yes, you have to have an idea of the technology. Ultrasound is sound, okay? And echo is echo, right? You don't really need to learn that in medical school. It's nice to know that. It's nice to know about your tooth, but I don't tell you about how the stethoscope is built, right? Or how the scalpel is built or how x-rays function. You don't need that to be able to use it. If you want to raise your game and become a cardiac sonographer or a specialist, then you could get into that. But if you're just trying to learn and you're not, because don't get me wrong, I've written uh, perhaps the most detailed book on the physics of ultrasound. So I'm a big fan of learning the foundation because if you want to optimize the use of a tool, you need to know the technology. But a medical student is not responsible for diagnosis, right? I want this device to teach him. You know, I know there are different approaches. I respect the different approaches, but my view is this. What is it that you need to learn to do what you're doing now? And if you don't need that, then I won't teach you that, right? If you want to become a cardiac sonographer and you need to know how to optimize instruments and how to deal with, identify artifacts and all those differences, then I'm going to go there. But I'm not going to saddle you or burden you with stuff because I'm taking you off your game. I'm distracting you and giving you more headache than you need. This is my honest perspective of ultrasound. You teach people what they need to know so that they could do better, a better job of what they do. And when you're getting, raising their game, like you're becoming a, a specialist or an echocardiographer, you need to know the ins and outs of how these machines work and their limitations, because then you're responsible for important diagnostic information. You know, as I said, I wrote a 590 page book with more than 3000 illustrations detailed on every aspect. No, a medical student doesn't need to know that. Honestly, that's my view. I know there are other views, but if you want to adopt this, I'm not going to teach you Spanish or Chinese if you don't need to know it, if you're not going to use it. That's my view. You, we have enough mm -hmm. headache on our plates already. I will teach you what you need to know. Then you'll run with it. Otherwise, you'll just forget it. And then you'll learn. You know, one of the worst things is, in my view, is to learn something which is highly detailed halfway. I, I never forgot what this guy's. Sorry. Anyhow, I'll shut up. Next question. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Thank you, Dr. Bullock. Uh, okay, so uh, another question that came in. What are the implementation of focus examination in term of uh, preventative medicine, especially globally focused? Oh, that is a big problem. If you were to think about just hypertension, right? If you were to think about screening for rheumatic heart disease that I touched you earlier, or if you're thinking about people walking around with heart failure, literally just having a transducer on a patient's chest and them getting an image, can more accurately pick up hypertension than you visiting a doctor or a hospital clinic for one simple reason. Even when you check hypertension in the clinic, oftentimes it's not, not done right and you, you're all over the place, white coat hypertension, et cetera. What you need to know is if you could get one image, someone could measure the thickness of the ventricles, you know it's longstanding ventricular hypertension. Or if you can screen for heart valves, or, or big problems, let's say uh, rheumatic heart disease, you know, that's the big application of this technology. And of course, congenital heart disease, of course, heart failure. You can screen for these things. And these are big global health problems that affect tens of millions of people or more. Great. Okay, let's see here. Time to, okay, so next question. How detailed do you recommend the cardiac exam for medical students? And which exams do you recommend leaving to resident education? Well, I go back to what I said before. What is it that is taught in your curriculum? That is the information that I would use focus to reach you to. Not, not, not anything more, not anything less. If you want to do it out of curiosity, you do it. But if you're learning cardiac anatomy, right? Whatever structures you're seeing in cardiac anatomy, use focus to tell you that. If you're doing physiology, Use focus to deal with that. So I am not trying to teach you to be a sonographer. There's a school for that, right? Because that's going to, I don't want to give you, in my view, I don't want to give you a bridge to nowhere. I want to meet you where you at. And if you need to cross and go over to another level, then I'm going to raise your game and raise the content to that level. But if you don't, if all you need, if you're doing cardiac anatomy, I'm not going to teach you to be a cardiac sonographer. There's a school for that. That's my honest view. Yep. 
Great. Okay. Well, that is all the time that we have. And, and we did get through all the questions. So, Dr. Bolwer, thank you for that. Um, and great questions out to you, audience members. Thank you for engaging and, and having questions for our presenter today. Um, Dr. Bolwer, I'll turn it over to you real quick. I say thank you to you. And uh, uh, any closing thoughts from you before I wrap up our session today? Well, focus is more than just a subject. It's really one of the coolest tools to advance how we care for people and how we can access and democratize technology. And so in that sense, it's really one of the best advances that we've had. This technology, ultrasound, and what it can do because it can reach people anywhere, any place, anytime. There's no other technology, imaging technology that can lay claim to that, not to mention its safety, not to mention that it plugs into the most uh, important uh, technology which is all over the world, which is a smartphone or tablet connected to the internet, you know, any place, anywhere, anytime, in a plane, in space, where you can do that, what technology, focus, ultrasound, at the point of care. Very good. Okay, thank you. Thank you everyone for your participation. That wraps up our session today. A recording of this webinar will be made available on the POCUS.org website in approximately one week. You will receive an email with a link to that once it is available and you will be able to continue, uh, can, uh, continue to access this content for free. Uh, for more POCUS talks, check out our Focus on POCUS podcast, POCUS blog posts, and of course, follow us on social media where we post regular POCUS clinical challenges. Thank you for attending our webinar today, and we look forward to seeing you on a future webinar. Thank you. Thank you.